Dr. Soule is going to speak with us today about judicial activism and judicial restraint. For many years in the two recent past, judicial activism was preeminent as a mode of non-originalist legal decision-making employed by political liberals to achieve their political agenda. Reversing the damage done in this anti-democratic pursuit of lofty goals requires a return to the original tent of the framers of our Constitution and the laws. And the ambition of those who share our views must be to have cases decided correctly according to originalist principles. Sometimes this will require the overruling of judicial precedent that has misconstrued the meaning of our constitutional guarantees and some have and will continue to call this activism. But it is not activism to get it right. And interpreting the terms of our Constitution according to the import attached to them by the framers is the only way to resolve the Madisonian dilemma of having a fundamentally anti-democratic institution, the unelected federal judiciary, wield power in a fundamentally democratic republic. Without further ado, it is my great, great pleasure to give you a remarkably courageous, a remarkably thoughtful, a remarkably intelligent, and a remarkably articulate man, Dr. Thomas Sowell, on the subject of judicial activism. Dr. Sowell. Thank you very much. Thank you. As a layman, I would like to raise some questions about judicial activism, beginning with what it means. My reading of the legal literature suggests that there are a multiplicity of meanings, some overlapping and others mutually contradictory, quite aside from those that are self-contradictory. Yet beneath the semantic quibbles and confusions are serious questions about the very meaning and survival of law, questions too important to be left solely to lawyers. The, the phrases judicial activism and judicial restraint raise logically obvious but often overlooked questions. Activism toward what? Restraint toward what? Are judges deemed to be activists or restrained in terms of their behavior toward, one, the legislature representing the current majority, two, statutes passed by legislatures representing changing popular majorities at many points in time, Three, the acts of current or past executive or administrative agencies. Four, the meaning of words in the Constitution. Five, the principles or purposes of those who wrote the Constitution. Or six, the legal precedents established by previous judicial interpretation. Activism or restraint toward one of these does not imply the same toward some of the others, and may in some instances imply the opposite towards some others or others. A restrained jurist attempting to hold fast to the original intention of constitutional provisions must actively strike down statutes passed by a legislature which repeatedly oversteps those bounds. Conversely, an activist jurist may passively accept expansive legislative action of a sort deemed consistent with constitutional values even if lacking specific constitutional authorization, or even if entering a gray area of constitutional prohibitions. One of the more striking examples of the latter was Justice William O. Douglas's repeated deference to the legislature in economic and social legislation, using language dear to the heart of those who believe in judicial restraint, though Justice Douglas was, of course, the classic judicial activist. Judicial activism cannot be reduced to a statistical question of how often judges strike down the decisions of other branches of government or of their predecessors on the bench. The controversies which rage over judicial activism are controversies as to the extent to which judges do or should decide cases on grounds extrinsic to constitutional or statutory provisions as written, and in particular on grounds counter to constitutional or statutory provisions as written. No one believes that all cases can be disposed of, each with a unique solution predetermined by black letter law. Some of the strongest advocates of judicial restraint, past and present, suggest rules of interpretation 
which, whatever their merits or demerits, are implicit recognitions that obvious, all-encompassing, and uniquely predetermined outcomes are not to be presupposed. The 100% literalist is a straw man, one of many straw men in this controversy. The degree of difficulty of constitutional interpretation cannot be independent of the specific goal of the interpreter. Seeking the cognitive meaning of words read as instructions is very different from seeking the philosophic values presumed to underlie those words. And both are very different from inferring the state of mind of those who wrote the words. Professor Ronald Dworkin urges that judicial interpretation be based on, quote, the underlying moral principles, unquote. The judges must decide between competing interpretations on the basis of which, quote, is superior as a matter of political morality, unquote. He is undertaking a fundamentally different task from that of Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, who said, when we know what the source of the law has said that it shall be, our authority is at an end. One of Holmes's dissenting opinions ended, I am not at liberty to consider the justice of the act. The degree of interpretive difficulty depends on the nature of the task undertaken in yet another way. Advocates of judicial activism often speak of the difficulty of determining exactly what is meant by such constitutional phrases as due process, privileges and immunities, or cruel and unusual punishment. Exactness is, of course, beyond human attainment, not only in constitutional interpretation, but even in the simplest physical measurement. Precision scientific instruments are not exact. They are accurate to within given tolerances, varying with the task at hand. No one in this room knows how far we are from the Washington Monument exactly. But if I said that we were 100 feet from the Washington Monument, no one would accept it. Nor would anyone accept it if I said that we were 100 miles from the Washington Monument. Decisiveness does not imply precision. It might be necessary to know exactly what constitutional provisions mean in all possible applications if courts were in the business of issuing comprehensive advisory opinions instead of in the business of deciding cases seriatim. The question is not what cruel and unusual punishment meant exactly, but whether the death penalty fell inside or outside its boundaries. The search for the cognitive meaning of instructions is not a search for pinpoint meanings, but for boundaries of meanings. Judicial activists who are not seeking the cognitive meaning of instructions may attempt to justify their alternative course of actions on whatever grounds they wish. But that is very different from attributing to their opponents a far more expansive task than those opponents have ever undertaken. In this regard, much has been made of the phrase original intent. This shorthand label for the philosophy of judicial restraint is often defined not by its advocates, but by judicial activists as encompassing the inner thoughts, philosophical values, or psychological state of those who wrote constitutional provisions or statutory law. Justice William J. Brennan, for example, has argued that the doctrine of original intent would require modern interpreters to discern exactly what the framers thought, unquote. Within this framework, Justice Brennan pointed out that, quote, the framers themselves did not agree, unquote, on all provisions of a jointly drafted document. And that it, its enactment involved not only the drafters, but also the congressional disputants and the ratifiers in the state. But the relevance of such considerations depends entirely on the framework adopted and the task it implies, a framework not adopted and a task not undertaken by advocates of original intent or judicial restraint. Legal interpretation of what someone wrote did not imply trying to, quote, get into his mind, unquote, according to Oliver Wendell Holmes, who also said, we do not inquire what the legislature meant. We ask only what the statute meant. Similar principles were applied by Holmes in contract law, where he said, parties may be bound by a contract 
to things which neither of them intended. In short, the prime responsibility for making words correspond with intentions was left with those who wrote the words, whether those words be contractual, statutory, or constitutional. Inevitable ambiguities may, in particular cases, lead to attempts at clarification from legislative history or other sources, but this clarification process is always subordinate to what is being clarified. Blackstone emphasized this with explicitly numbered rules of interpretation in which the second step was to be resorted to only after the first step failed, and the third only after the second failed, and so on. The whole process ending whenever the original cognitive meaning was discerned with sufficient clarity for the case at hand. Some of the elements of interpretation by judicial activists and by advocates of judicial restraint are similar in themselves, but tend to play very different roles. In particular, judicial activists do not treat such considerations as legislative purposes as mere subordinate instruments for discerning cognitive meaning, but as factors entitled to a coordinate role. Thus, both Justice Brennan and Professor Dworkin saw the decisive factor in the Weber case as the legislative purpose they inferred rather than what Justice Brennan called a literal interpretation of the Civil Rights Act and what Professor Dworkin called staring at the words Congress used. <laughs> the creative nature of their inference of legislative purpose may be apparent to anyone familiar with the legislative history of the Civil Rights Act. But this is consistent with their more general reading of law, not as a set of instructions, but as a general moral mandate. They were faithful in their fashion to this moral mandate, even if somewhat casual about instructions, which they were too polite to stare at. The central argument for judicial activism is not that the cognitive meaning of law is unclear, but that those meanings should not be followed. As Justice Brennan said of the Constitution, those who would restrict claims of right to the values of 1789, specifically articulated in the Constitution, turn a blind eye to social progress and eschew adaptation of overarching principles to changes of social circumstances. According to Justice Brennan, the genius of the Constitution rests not in any static meaning it may have had in a world that is dead and gone, but in the adaptability of its great principles to cope with current problems and current needs. Similar views can be found throughout a vast literature, inside and outside the legal profession, at both scholarly and popular levels. The repeated and insistent emphasis on change, surely one of the most common and uncontroverted features of human history, is difficult to understand, except as a prelude to the non sequitur that judges are the authorized agencies of particular changes favored by particular advocates. Generic change is simply not a controversial issue. Even individuals commonly identified as conservative often have a breathtaking range of changes which they would like to see introduced. Differing in specifics, more so than in number or magnitude, from the changes advocated by those labeled liberal or radical. It was Edmund Burke who said, a state without the means of some change is without the means of its conservation. Among the changes he advocated were profound changes in persons, policies, and institutions, both in Ireland and India, the abolition of slavery, and freedom for the American colonies. Even today, we would not regard such changes as cosmetic. Milton Friedman's most recent book is entitled The Tyranny of the Status Quo. It doesn't sound like the book of a man who is against change. <laughs> Among the changes he has advocated over a long period of years are the destruction of the entire banking industry and Federal Reserve System as we know them. the total elimination of government agencies numbering in the hundreds, <laughs> and other innovations in the economy 
that would make the New Deal revolution seem rather tame. Change has never been the issue. The specifics of the changes, and above all, the authorized agencies and processes for bringing it about are the issue. Lofty and unctuous discussions of the need for generic change serve no purpose but to evade this crucial institutional question. The issue is not what to do, but who is to decide what to do. Technological or other changes which render it impossible to uh, fully apply constitutional provisions in their original senses, uh, electronic listening devices or aerial surveillance, for example, have seldom been involved in the great constitutional cases which have produced firestorms of controversy. On the contrary, these cases have usually dealt with things well known at the time the Constitution was adopted. Abortion, prayer in school, the arrest of criminals, the segregation of the races, uneven voter representation, and executions. The other feature of Justice Brennan's argument for judicial activism, moral values, is as irrelevant in this context as generic change. Emphatic reiteration of the theme of morality, like emphatic reiteration of the theme of change, evades the crucial question of whose morality, or analogously, whose change, whose meaning, whose purposes, whose intent. The question is not whether rights should be, quote, taken seriously, unquote, but whose conception of rights, there being some conception of rights which are the very negation of rights as conceived by others. Holmes put his finger on the, this crucial point when he said that the Constitution, quote, is made for people of fundamentally differing views, unquote. Those who, who wish to insinuate their particular views into the law under generic labels of change and morality, ignore or evade this central point. Some advocates of judicial activism argue as if there was some issue as to whether or to what degree there should be morality in the law. They characterize as moral skeptics or moral relativists, those who urge judicial restraint. But what is in fact at issue is not morality, but the institutional source of that morality. As Justice Robert, as Judge Robert H. Bork, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> has said, in a constitutional democracy, the moral content of, of the framer or the legislator of the law must be given by the morality of the framer or the legislator, never by the morality of the judge. Nor is this a new or unique position. Justice Holmes made the same separation between the importance of morality in the law and the institutional source of morality. Holmes called the law the witness and external deposit of our moral life and described its history as the history of the moral development of the race. But as a member of the Supreme Court, he often said to his fellow jurists, I hate justice, as an argument to be weighed by them in the context in which they were working. More generally, he said, moral predilections must not be allowed to influence our minds in settling legal distinctions. Rather, he saw his judicial role as being, quote, to see that the game is played according to the rules whether I like them or not. Fidelity to rules does not imply an ab abdication of moral judgment. The distinction between unfettered individual freedom of conscience and the very real moral constraints of social duty were made by Socrates when he drank the hemlock. It was not moral neutrality. No one believes that whatever a democratic majority does is right including the majority. Constitutional democracy is their affirmation of that. Yet numerous arguments against pure majoritarianism demonstrate again the fatal lure of straw men and the failure of the real issues to be joined. Nevertheless, 
It would be a serious mistake to believe that the differences between those who advocate judicial activism and those who advocate judicial restraint is simply a matter of semantics or political tactics. The, their differences go very deep, all the way to their underlying visions of human beings. The kind of human being conceived by those who have historically advocated judicial restraint is a very different creature from the kind of human being envisioned by those who urge judicial activism. The kinds of societies and institutions appropriate to these two kinds of creatures, called by the same name, necessarily differ, just as an ideal society for whales will necessarily differ from an ideal society for ants or eagles. Those with a highly constrained vision of man's capabilities, both mental and moral, seek institutions and institutional roles which confine the discretion of each individual to a narrow circle within which he may be competent, rather than let his decisions roam over vast reaches where all are certain to be incompetent. Blackstone's vision of man was that his reason is corrupt and his understanding full of ignorance and error. Given the frailty, the imperfection, and the blindness of human reason, Blackstone's desire to keep judges on a short leash was understandable. All institutional roles are confined in this vision. The boundaries of specialties, such as morality and law, for example, are respected and the specialist deferred to within his realm. In short, man's competence does not extend far enough for him to be trusted with, the, with more than limited responsibilities according to the constrained vision. Judicial restraint is only one application of this general principle. The businessman is likewise not to attempt to exercise, quote, social responsibility, unquote, according to this view, but to run his own particular business as efficiently as he can. The, the limited uh, competence of the specialists also explains the opposition of this vision to advocacy journalism, liberation theology, and other kinds of activities in which the specialist tries to take on a more general role. The broad authority necessarily given to political and legal institutions was acceptable to those with this vision insofar as it consisted essentially of defining the boundaries of others' discretion, not second guessing their discretion within those boundaries. This meant defining the rules of a process. This whole vision of law and of social processes in general becomes very different when the key assumptions of the constrained vision are dropped. Then it becomes possible to conceive of a wider scope for the discretion of those who control social processes in general, judges being just one example. When Ronald Dworkin wrote of a fusion of moral and legal theory, he echoed a long tradition in which many have lamented the needless boundaries between the disciplines. This melding of different disciplines and roles is quite different from Holmes's urging of legal practitioners to learn economics, for example, which did not imply any interdisciplinary blurring of the lines between the two fields. The issue between the two visions is not whether most people have broad or narrow abilities. The issue is whether man as such has inherently very limited moral and intellectual potential, the brightest and the best as well as the masses. It is unnecessary to attempt to resolve this conflict of visions. That would be a relevant task if we were back in 1787 trying to create a constitution. But now that a constitution has, been, has endured for 200 years, the issue is not whether it should have been constructed according to a constrained or an unconstrained vision. However it was constructed then, it is a fact of life today. And the question for today is whether it is to be changed, by whom and through what processes. Much discussion of alternative moral values and moral systems is irrelevant in this context. If the Constitution does not enact Herbert Spencer's social statics, neither does it enact John Stuart Mill's on liberty or John Rawls's A Theory of Justice. Thank you.